I did want to take a second just to say thank you uh, for so many people who have blessed us, who have helped us get our stuff in Wisconsin and move down here, get the trucks unloaded. And so I wanted to say one thank you. Thank you to Daniel and April for helping us by giving me the chance to get settled in. It is April, right? Okay. <laughs> they looked at me and I went, oh, I might have said that wrong. Um, but they're just a blessing to us because I can help them unpack and we can kind of feel at home as we get started. But there, there's also been some confusion about when I begin starting. My first Monday is the 14th, so a week from tomorrow. But the first Sunday I'll be preaching, there has been some confusion. I heard about it last night at the cookout. will be June 20th. And with that, we're going to begin a series in the book of Psalms leading up until Labor Day. So we'll go 10 or 12 weeks, however many that is. Looking at the idea of, man, what does it mean to be happy? Because that's really what the Psalms are about. The start of the very first word is blessed or blessed. And so what, what does it mean to be blessed? What does it mean to be happy? And not ignoring the heartache and the heartbreak that we deal with when life is up and life is down. What does God say uh, is actually that blessed life? So we're going to be walking through the book of Psalms doing that. So that's June 20th. My first Monday, though, will be June 14th. And the other thing I was going to mention, oh, is uh, just so there's no kind of confusion, I will often be asking questions to, and saying, hey, I'm going to understand Manchester, Scott County, the Morgan, Green County area. And the way I think about it is when I met my wife, I began asking her questions to kind of understand who she is and what she loved and what she was about. And so we would have phone conversations until my phone died late at night. I lived in Texas. She lived here in Illinois. And so we would talk for hours me getting to know her. And to this day, if we go on a road trip, we will almost always miss turns because we ignore the GPS because we're talking. And I might be asking questions that could feel like, oh, is he using that to try and understand how to change things or how to fix things or is he asking for ammunition? But I think of it as I'd be asking questions so I can love Manchester and I can love Manchester Baptist. So when I ask you questions and I'm saying, hey, what about this? Or why was it done this way? Or um, hopefully you can... Uh, Join me in thinking, hey, this is so we can love each other and know each other well. So when I ask questions, that will be, uh, that's my heart behind asking those questions. <coughs> Let's go ahead and pray and we'll get started. Father, we love you. We thank you um, that we get to gather, we get to worship you, that we get to sing your word, we get to hear your word, that we get to minister to each other. We, we just ask your spirit to come now and join us as we worship. Thank you, Pastor Joe. If you would stand with me as we uh, start our worship today.
this Sunday and next Sunday. And God knew that, didn't He? He knew why. And so, Daniel, we're pleased to have both you and people with us. They'll be here this morning and also this evening and also next Sunday. So, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's exciting to hear this morning. I tell you what, the place is filling up and it's awesome. And all the kids running around. As soon as we walk in the door, there were kids running by. And it's exciting. <laughs> it's exciting to see that. And the new pastor, we got to meet Pastor John. And it's just really, really cool coming here this morning. It's a little bit, it's like. It's like night and day from the deep dark of COVID days. You had a faithful. You can't hear me. There. Is that better? Maybe. Can you hear me in the back? I do like to mumble some. So if you can't tell what I'm saying, it's hard. I'll get too quiet. That's why these are better for me. If I'm using a mic or a handheld or something, I'll be. Start mumbling and it'll start shrinking that. <laughs> and uh, April's like, you mumbled halfway through that sermon, and so that's my hillbilly coming out. So I apologize for that. But it is exciting, a beautiful day out there. Let's look into the Word of God and see what we get for today. Let's look at uh, Romans chapter 14, verse number 17. We live in uh, a time in history where we have more conveniences and more things to make our life easier than ever before. I mean, we can pick up our phone and talk to somebody on the other side of the world, and uh, we need information about something. We don't have to search and dig and go to the library. We can whip out our phone and find the answer in no time. So there's so many things in our life that are geared to making our life easier, less stressful, and it seems like we're more stressed out than ever. If you take our phones, that should make our life a lot less stressful. But we add things like Facebook and Instagram, and then it gets people involved, and it gets complicated and even more stressful. There's uh, people commit suicide over things that they read on Facebook and their friends and things like that, and it causes stress in their life and, and worry and fear. And uh, we can look at politics. You get really stressed out looking at politics. You can look at the uh, other nations, like China and, uh, and Russia, and other nations who are seeming to be building up, anticipating conquest, and you just wonder whether you know America is ready to face something like that again. There's lots of reasons for stress as we look, at, watch the news, and as we look around in our lives. And uh, we're going to talk today about God's recipe for peace. Romans 14:17. Uh, says, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this great church and the time that we can spend with them together today, singing to you and about you and with our brothers and sisters in Christ and fellowshipping and opening your word. I pray that you fill me with your spirit and speak through me as I present it to these your people. Help us all to have open hearts and to be uh, sensitive to your Holy Spirit as you lead us, as you guide us through your word and teach us your word and teach us the, the spiritual truth behind it and why you wrote it and how it applies to us today. In your name we pray. Amen. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Colossians 3.15 says, And let the peace of God rule in your heart of which also you're called in one body, and be thankful. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. Let it have control, the peace of God. Um, that, that verse sounds awesome. For me to just be at peace, for God's peace to just control every area of my life, for me not to go around worried and anxiety, full of anxiety and stressed out. I mean, stress causes so many problems, so many health problems. It's not just problem in your mind. Stress can cause all of your body functions to start uh, wearing out and wearing down and not functioning properly. It can cause your, first, it really messes with your digestive system, which then goes into all the areas. Stress is just a killer. And uh, as Christians, we live in a stressful world, but we don't have to have a stressful life. We don't have to have a stressful heart. We don't have to have turmoil in our heart. We can be at peace and let the peace of God rule in our hearts. And we are called to this peace and uh, in one body. 
and uh, we have been given the recipe. Now, if I were to tell you that, uh, tell you a recipe for chocolate chip cookies, and it's got, um, I asked April if you those things, okay? Uh, uh, chocolate chips, uh, flour, butter, well, I don't know what you put in here. She has a secret ingredient that I might, should I tell you a secret ingredient? Uh, and uh, baking powder or soda, one or the other. Um, it doesn't matter if you put soda or powder. Um, yes. No, it doesn't matter. Uh, what's your, what are the ingredients you put in there? What did I miss? Salt, we need a dash of salt, right? And lots of chocolate chips. You put that in the oven and you have amazing chocolate chip cookies. That word and is pretty important because that's an accumulative word. It's saying you got all this recipe you're putting together and you have great chocolate chip cookies. So let's find a place where God uses that word in connection with peace. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, we'll look over there. Philippians 4, 7. <coughs> Philippians um, was written by Paul, of course, and it's written at a time when he didn't have much reason for hope and didn't have much reason for peace in his heart. And yet, at this time, when, when his life is, it is very stressful and he's got nothing that seems to be going right, he gives us God's recipe for peace. God's recipe for peace. In Philippians 4, 7, it says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The word and, cumulative action, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding. In other words, it doesn't make sense why I have this peace in my heart. You're like, I would like to have God's peace, but I've got this going on. I would like to have God's peace, but you don't know about my family situation. I would like to have God's peace, but I just got fired at work. They lay people off. I would like to have peace, but my health. I just got horrible news at work. Any number of things. It makes sense that I am not at peace. It makes sense that, that, that there's all this turmoil and stress in my life because of this and this. Well, Paul's saying that you can have peace that defies logic. Peace that passes all understanding. I don't know why, even though my health is horrible, even though my financial situation is bad, even though this is happening, this is happening in my life, I don't know why, but I'm still, I still have peace in my heart. That's the peace of God that defies logic. The peace of God that passes understanding. And that peace of God can rule in your life and my life. And that becomes an, an extraordinary witness. An extraordinary witness to your family. An extraordinary testimony and witness to your co-workers, to uh, your doctors, whoever you're interacting with. When they see you at peace. They see God's peace ruling in your heart. They want that. And they see that and they know there's something different about that. It's an extraordinary testimony to others of the grace of God, the power of God, and the peace of God that is, comes through knowing Him. And it can be a great source of witness. So this accumulative effect means that we need to back up and see the recipe. So what is the recipe for God's heart? Peace. It's unexplainable peace that keeps us, that walks guard around us as a sentinel. Let's look back up at verse 4. We'll just go ahead and read from verse 1 on. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech you to sin and beseech sin that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with women also, and with other of my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. Let your moderation be known to all men, the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. He said, I just gave you a recipe. If you'll follow this recipe, the peace of God will guard your heart. It'll walk signal around. No, nothing outside of you, of your heart, of your life that's impacting you is 
going to be able to get through. It's going to be able to break that barrier of God's peace. First of all, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Not in your circumstances, but in the Lord. Don't rejoice in your job. God gave you that job. It may be a great job. It may give you financial security. But don't rejoice in your job. Rejoice in the one who gave you that job. Right? You may have great health, but don't rejoice in the fact that you have good health. Rejoice in your God who gave you that good health. You may have great relationships with your family, your loved ones, co-workers, neighbors. Don't rejoice in those relationships. Rejoice in the God who gave you those people in your lives. Why should we not rejoice in the things that God has given us? Why should we rejoice in the Lord? Because your job could be gone tomorrow. That loved one who you have such a great relationship with, they may hear a rumor and get mad at you and never talk to you for again or for years. Your health, you could go to the doctor tomorrow. We have a friend at our church in Meridosha. She went to the doctor last week, I think it was Tuesday, and uh, Wednesday night we found out she's having open heart surgery on Friday. She had no idea she was going to be eating that. She's going for a checkup. She goes there and Friday she's going to be having hours and hours of serious surgery. She thought her health was pretty good and found out it wasn't that great. So she, if we rejoice in our health, it could be gone tomorrow. It could be gone right now. We don't know. Right? So we rejoice in the Lord. Because even when our health is gone, even when people turn their back on us, even when there's a financial reversal, they're still our Savior. They're still our God. We rejoice in the one who gives us those blessings. The Lord never changes, and therefore, your rejoicing doesn't have to. The devil would love to get you to shift your focus from the giver of your blessings to your blessings. Because he, because he'll do what he did to Job. Job had been given great blessings, and Satan said, I'm going to get Job to turn his back on you. Because I'm going to take away all of his blessings. And Satan could take away Job's blessings, but he couldn't take away Job's God and his faith in his God. And Satan can come in and mess up your life and your relationships and your financial situation, but he can't take away your God. He can't take away your relationship with your God unless you give it up. Unless you give it away. Hebrews 13 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. If our rejoicing is in the Lord, that's the first part of the recipe, then we will always be able to rejoice. We'll always be able to rejoice because He never changes. Number two is the next verse. Let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord has a hand. The word moderation means to be gentle and patient with others. Gentle and patient with others. In other words, love others. Love one another. You see, uh, a lot of our stress in life, maybe most of it, I don't know, comes from relationships. Relationships. That's why Facebook can cause so much stress in somebody's life, or Instagram, or social media, because it's relational. It's people liking what you post, or not liking what you post, or... I mean, just it, it, it causes so many conflicts in relationships because some of the most stress in our life comes through comes from people not liking us or being mean or, or, or letting us down. We, if we're gentle and patient with others and we love one another, we find out um, Proverbs ten twelve. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covereth all sin. And love covers a multitude of sin, the Bible says in another verse. And love for others and seeking and desiring their benefit will cause us to not be so stressed out when somebody rejects us. Not be so stressed out and not be so worried and filled with anxiety over relational and relationship problems. Because people are people. They have the same sin nature that you do. They are living the same fallen flesh that you do. They're going to let you down. They're going to break your heart. 
Even if they don't want to, they're going to they're gonna slip up. And you're going to do the same thing to someone else. And we expect things of people, and often they don't come through with those expectations. And that also lets us down and causes stress and worry and anxiety, especially with your children and families, probably the worst because we expect more of our family than others. When we don't get from someone what we expect, it causes turmoil and stress. If we love them, we'll be seeking their good, not ours. In turn, we'll be more patient and gentle with them. Proverbs 13.10 says, Only by pride cometh contention. And that contention, when you have contention in your life, when you're with your relationships and your family and your friends, that's extremely stressful. There's no peace in your relationship, and that can spill over into other parts of your life. And you wish you had that peace. Only by pride is that contention coming. Pride is me wanting my way. Pride is me not loving you. When I want my way over your way, I'm loving me more than you. When I want your blessings and I'm seeking your benefit over my own, that's me loving you. That's the opposite of pride. And the contention ceases when the pride is removed. And other people may be wanting their way, and that half of your relationship will cause still cause contention. But on your side, for your peace and your testimony and your life and your heart, you loving them and wanting their benefit and their blessings covers a multitude of sin and brings you great peace when you remove that pride and we love one another. So the first part of the recipe is to rejoice in the Lord. The second is to be gentle and patient with others. Let's look at the next one. Be careful for nothing. Full of care, full of worry, anxious. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Worry about nothing. You see, when we trust God more than the power of our circumstances, we don't have to worry. We don't have to be anxious. Because God is, greater is He that is in you than what? He that is in the world. He that is in the world is Satan. He that is in the world is stirring up problems in your family. He that is in the world is trying to get you to have all kinds of situations and circumstances that get you to doubt God's love for you. That gets you to doubt God really wants what's best for you. And that's all it takes. If Satan can get you to doubt God, to be suspect of God, he's going to get you drawn away from God. Drawn, and, and the peace of God will be far from you because you are running from God instead of to God. Instead of with, instead of, you're walking away from God instead of walking with God. I start worrying when I start seeing my problems as bigger than my solutions. Now, if I were, I'm a, do we have any Cardinals fans in here? Raise your hand, Cardinals fan. Praise the Lord. If you have any Cubs, if there's any Cubs fans, you can leave now. Uh, but they're doing pretty good, actually, the Cubbies. But uh, the Cardinals have caused me great stress this week. It's been bad. Six out of seven losses. How is that even possible? Out of six losses out of seven games. But, um, you know, when they're playing the Dodgers, I can get stressed out whether they're going to, you know why? Because they're playing a team that can easily beat them. And the solution for me is for them to win. And the problem is that the Dodgers will win. And that seems like the problem is bigger than my solution. Now, if I was watching a game and the Cardinals were playing uh, the li local Little League team, it would be fun to watch, probably, but I would have no stress because I would not be worried about the Little League team hating the Cardinals, right? Because the solution is the, the problem of the Cardinals losing 
the solution is easy. They're going to easily beat them. Now, if the daughters are playing, then that's going to cause stress because I start worrying when I start seeing my problem as bigger than my solution. You see the stress not there at all in another situation where the stress is there because the problem becomes bigger than my solution. And you look at your life and you've got problems. You've got financial problems. You've got relation problems. And we start getting stressed out and worrying when the solution, when our problem seems bigger than our solution. The problem may be bigger than your solution because you may look at your checkbook and say, this bill is bigger than this amount in my checking account. The problem is bigger than my solution. You may see a relationship problem and you have been trying and praying and trying to get God to work in this situation and it just doesn't seem possible. You've been as kind as you can be, as loving as you can be, and it's still a mess. And you see the problem as bigger than your solution. And that causes stress. It's stressful when the problem is bigger than our solution. But if we're experiencing that stress and not having that peace, it's because we're looking at the wrong solution. We're looking at our solution, what we can come up with, what we can conjure up, instead of looking at God. He is our solution. He still is the answer. And He has the answers for us. Therefore, as a child of God, the solution is always bigger than my problem. My problem, no matter what it is, is never bigger than my solution because my solution is God. And greater is He that is in me than He that is in the world. So, I don't have to worry about anything because my solution is greater than my problem. Next in that verse, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. <coughs> in everything, everything in our lives, we should take to our Father. We should talk to God about. We should take it to Him in prayer. Pray about everything. First is rejoice in the Lord. Second, be gentle and patient with others. Love one another. Third is worry about nothing. Fourth is pray about everything. Praise and request with a heart of gratitude. You see, when we have gratitude in our heart to God, when we're praying, we're bringing a request to Him with thanksgiving, that's crucial. Not just to come to Him in prayer, but to come to Him with thanksgiving. Why is that important? Because when I am coming to God with thanksgiving, I'm thanking Him for something. What am I thanking Him for? I'm thanking Him for the time that He brought me through that financial problem last year. I'm thanking Him for bringing me through that COVID illness. I'm thanking Him for the answer to prayer last week. I'm thanking Him for the answer to prayer last year. When I'm coming to Him with gratitude and thanksgiving, in my mind, I'm being reminded of all the other times that God brought me through those problems. All the other times where I was concerned and worried, and God brought me through. And therefore, God, I'm asking you to do this because I know you can. You've already done this and that and something else. God has already worked many miracles in our lives. We need to stop and focus on them. Think about it. As we go to Him, remember what He's done in your life. Thank Him for it. Have that heart of gratitude. That right there erases a lot of stress because it assures us that if God got me through that, He can get me through this. There's nothing that He can't get us through. We should take everything to the Lord. He's the only one who has power over our circumstances. There are some things that you can't control. If you're cooking supper and your um, pot is about to boil over and you hear it over there, the lid starts rattling, that's within your control. You can jump up and go take the lid off. I do it all the time if I'm making 
morning, sometime I wake up later on, then we go and they boil over, and she says, I've told you a million times, take the lid off the noodles, and I forget every time. So, uh, that's within my power, though. I don't have to just sit in the living room, listen to the steam roll off the, uh, off the stove top as the water boils over. I don't have, that's stressful, but I don't have to go through that stress. That's within my power. I can get up and I can change it. But the things that really bring our hearts down, the things that really keep us from having peace, are the things beyond our ability to control, the circumstances beyond our ability. And the only one who has power over our circumstances is God. God ultimately is the one who has the power. Therefore, we should take it, our request to the only one that really can help. If um, you need help, fixing your lawnmower and you take it to April, she's going to be like, why are you bringing me this? I can't fix this. Actually, she could fix something. She could fix, she can repair, a, rebuild a carburetor on a third bike, but I don't know about a lawnmower. But uh, she's pretty good at that. So you take, in other words, you, 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 you want to take your car to a mechanic because you think he has the ability, the skills, the power to make that fixed for you, to, to take care of that problem in your life, to fix that circumstance. Well, God has the power to fix any circumstance, and He's the only one that does. You don't take your car to, to a McDonald's and ask them to fix it. They don't have any ability to do that. Right? And so, we don't take our big problems to our friends and say, fix this. We shouldn't take our big problems and dump them on people. We should take them to God who can actually change things. God who can actually, who actually has the power to change things. Pray about everything. Some things God will say no about. But many things God wants to give us, we never ask for and never get. Some things God will say no to you about or he'll say way about. But there's many things that God wants, I'm convinced of this, there's many things that God wants to give us, but we never ask Him for. Think about all the miracles that Jesus performed. They came up and they said, uh, Jesus, please come. And he did. What, what about all the people who wonder whether they should, you know, all the sick people or the blind people who heard about Jesus coming through town? And they thought about going and asking him to heal him, but they're like, ah, he probably can't heal me. He probably won't heal me. He probably doesn't care about me. For all the people that we read about Jesus healing, how many people were like that? They just didn't get up and go make the effort to ask Jesus to heal them. The Bible says you have not. Why? Because he asked not. That means there are blessings that God has for us. There is peace that God has for us. There are answers to our problems and our circumstances and our issues in our life that God has for us. But we don't ask Him. How many blessings have we missed out on in our life because we didn't ask Him? You have not because you asked Him. The fact of the matter is that God will work in behind the scenes. He'll work in your life. He'll give you blessings that you never asked for. He'll give you blessings you never even thought about asking for. But yet there are some things that he is reserving and waiting on you to ask. Why? Because he wants to show you how much he loves you. He wants to show you that he cares. And if he just gives us stuff that we don't even ask for, we start getting a little spoiled, don't we? We start being that little spoiled brat who starts expecting everything. When we ask for something and we humbly go to him and ask him to intervene, and he does, we know for sure, God, that was you. That was something that only you could do make that happen in my life. And that brings great peace to our hearts. Every miracle Jesus performed because someone had the faith to ask him to do it. What about the ones who chickened out or didn't believe that uh, he could heal them and didn't ask? Our lack of faith leads us our lack of faith leads us to a lack of prayer which leads us to a lack of blessings which leads us to a lack of peace. Our lack of faith leads us to a lack of prayer, which leads us to a lack of blessings, which leads us to a lack of peace. 
And also, everything starts with our faith. What we believe God can do, what we believe we believe He will do. There is nothing He can't do. And there are many things He will do if we ask Him. First thing was rejoice in the Lord. Be gentle and patient with others. Worry about nothing. Pray about everything. Romans 15, 13 says this. Now the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Do you believe the Word of God? Do you believe that if, you know, if I, if I wrote a uh, cookbook and I came up with all kinds of recipes and uh, you took that cookbook and you tried to make something that I told you how to make, uh, it could be interesting. Come up with some very interesting dishes, but uh, I would uh, you shouldn't put too much faith. If it's going to be, if you're taking it to a potluck or something, you would not want to use my recipe for the first time. You want to try out my recipe first, trust me. But if God gives us a recipe, it's going to come out right every time because God doesn't mess up recipes. We mess up the recipe, but God created the recipe, and the recipe is always perfect if God gives it to us. The God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. You know, when you have peace, joy comes with it. The first verse that we read, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. As a child of God, the Holy Ghost indwells us, lives within us. That peace and that joy we have access to. And we cannot just have joy and peace. We can be filled with joy and peace. The God of all hope fill you with all joy and all peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Both of those verses we see the Holy Ghost prominently, the Holy Spirit prominently on His blood. He's the one that makes it happen. And we can abound in hope. Hope is, hope is so awesome. Hope is so awesome. And a lack of hope, that, that's why people eventually commit suicide. They come to the point where they have zero hope. There is no more hope. There's no more hope. As a child of God, we can not only have hope, we can abound with hope through the Holy Spirit as a result of the joy and the peace that is filling our hearts because we're believing what He said. And we're doing what he said, we're following him in obedience. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. To keep means to walk guard around as a sentinel. Not only can you have that peace, you can be protected. Your heart can be protected by that peace. You can be kept by that peace. Because there's going to be things coming at you. They're not going to stop. Tomorrow and next day, next week, next year, there's going to be different things to cause stress, different things Satan send in your way to rob you of your peace and your joy in Christ. But if we follow God's recipe, we can abound in peace. And even when we can't explain it, we can have that indescribable, unexplainable, real peace in our hearts from the Holy Ghost. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your peace. Thank you for your Holy Spirit within us. Help us to seek you every day. Help us to read your word, to meditate on it. I pray that we take these truths from your word and we think about it. And that we would focus on it this week and meditate on it. And as we meditate, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will transform our hearts into, from a heart of stress to a heart of peace. From a heart of worry to a heart of peace. From a heart of fear to a heart of joy and hope. Because of all that you are and all that you have for us and all that you do for us. We thank you, Father. In your name we pray. Amen.
Thank you. You can stand with me as we close with this song.